someone says, well, they still have their annual banquet and tiptoe in on Broadway. You go up there, have some chicken and green peas and chicken soup. That sounds good to me. So I went to the Tiptoe Inn that year, 1963. I felt a little awkward because here I was, a square-looking fellow wearing a suit and a tie with a briefcase, looking like any other FBI agent, perhaps. How will they trust me? Would they talk to me? Yeah, these were militants, revolutionaries. What sort of people are there? And I entered this room where they were making speeches and there were songs and they saw me come in. And I was absolutely enthralled by these people. And 15 years later, my opinion hasn't changed. Not one whit. I'm a man of peace, and that's why I'm an anarchist. It may sound very, very contradictory, but this is the fact. Anarchism is a peace movement. I think my ideas were all my life. It wasn't that I had to read about it, but I, I was naturally believing in freedom and not to impose and not to dictate anybody. Everybody was molding a little bit, the, the younger generation, and that's how became with that. I was never a communist and I was never anything else but an anarchist. Oh, Alice Island, du Grenets von Freiland, wie grausam, wie schrecklich du bist. who had come out of Eastern Europe or who were still living in, in Europe were not only a religious group, but were a nation. And uh, they were treated as a nationality group with a lot of prejudice against them, but treated as a, as a nationality group. And uh, the Jews, like Frenchmen or Germans or Italians or Spaniards, uh, were, became anarchists, a certain number of them did, so that they were known as Jewish anarchists, just as there are Spanish anarchists or Italian anarchists, but not because they were religious anarchists. I come from a Hasidic family, and I was a believer in, in the Jewish religion, in the very strict Orthodox religion, but I had my doubts apparently since my early childhood, and when I uh, uh, finally freed myself of the religious dogma, I still remain a Jew, I still consider myself as a Jew, but a secular Jew. And uh, I consider myself an anarchist because I believe in the uh, attainability of a, a system of society without government. Anarchism in the 1880s and 1890s is probably the largest radical movement among the Jewish immigrants. These immigrants actually were upset by the world that confronted them when they arrived in the United States. They were disappointed. For some, of course, it's the legendary streets paved with gold, which they failed to find. I don't think any of the anarchist working men were anticipating anything like that. But they could not foresee the wrenching experience that they underwent from one world to the other. Oscar Handlin, the Harvard historian, wrote a famous book called The Uprooted. And they were uprooted from one land, one culture, one world, and cast into another world where conditions of labor were, if anything, worse than they had found and more rigorous and more demanding than they had been in the old country. And the sweatshops were no better than the factories in 
Lodge or Bialystok, for example, from which many of them had come. And they, re they were revolted by the entire ethic of capitalism that they found here in the United States, in New York, in Baltimore, in Boston, Philadelphia, and other large cities where they tended to settle in addition to the Lower East Side. So what they did was to replace this world with a counter world, American culture with a counterculture, and they began to establish their whole anarchist culture, an anarchist milieu. On July the 4th, 1890, they started with the Freie Arbeitsstimme. The paper from its very inception was uh, a, an economic paper, an anarchist paper, spreading the ideas of a society without government, without coercion, without force, without wars. The, the immediate task of forming unions to help to relieve the economic situation of this stretch up worker, and at the same time helping develop Yiddish culture, Yiddish theater, Yiddish poetry, Yiddish literature. And it went on like this till the end of 1977. After 87 and a half years, the Freie Arbeiterstimme had to cease publication. Now here is the guy that we were waiting for. So this is our secretary. Uh -huh. Let me introduce him first. Okay. Yeah. Why doesn't he come out? Come here. Because, you know, I we don't want to be a secretary. No, I'm <laughs> the anarchist, you know, no, like... Now, anarchist. wait a minute. We are Sam in a hurry. They may shut off the electricity from now between 3 o'clock. They will. Yeah, anytime. So what okay. purposes are... He is the secretary of the management committee, managing yeah, committee of the Fire <laughs> Now, aside from this, he is a master, a retired master mariner. He helped us win the first, the Second World War by convoying help and material and ships to more mines. He also did another thing. Oh, he's got a cigarette. He, 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 has a no. he, also, he also helped break, I mean, break through the British blockade uh, around Palestine uh, yeah. and smuggle illegal immigrants, illegal immigrants to Israel. Now tell him. Palestine, there was no Israel there, there was Palestine. Well, actually, we're here filming the closing in the the Fry Arbiter Stimme. So what, we were talking about his early days. I was wondering what's the circulation now as compared to when I don't first know went exactly what the circulation is. Don't you read the Fry Arbiter Stimme? It's 1700. The last yeah. circulation was 1700. Yeah. By the way, you have these points there in the... Oh, you want it here. Yeah, it's 1700. But it was not sufficient enough because we only charged $7 a year. And the, the expenses for printing and mailing are twice as much. And we couldn't charge more because many of our readers couldn't afford to pay more. So this is the reason My why... My observation is this, you know. There was all kinds of libertarian... Uh, there were anarchist publications, Italian, Spanish, uh, other languages. But they gave up, you know. They gave up the ship. The Jews are a stubborn lot, you know. See, so they kept it going, you know, and our family the language is passing away, so they have. That's, that's my observation. I think I'm right. It's a sad day for you? Huh? It's a sad day for you, the closing? It's not a sad day, you know. It, you look at all these books, you know, how idealistic they were to put the books out. The gospel, what you might call, you know. And uh, it's a different age you live in. You think? Are those ideas still, I mean, still important to you? Do you, do you think the they're as realistic are, the, as when you... The idea, those ideas have been going on God knows how long, you know. Don't, don't, uh, don't take me that I say God knows that I believe there is a big boss with long beard and side locks, you know. What do you want from don't, me? God? Don't walk because she has to walk away from you. <laughs> but uh, are you still as idealistic as you were when you first read the Fry Arbiter You have to be idealistic, otherwise you might as well take a gun and blow your brains out, you know. Nicht such mich wut, die Myrten grünen, du findest mich dort nicht, mein Schatz. Die Lebenswelten bei Maschinen, dort ist ein Ruheplatz, dort Such mir Ruhe, die Fegel singen, 
Starting the the Fire were very much interested in other things. They were very much for cooperatives, for building cooperatives, for the unions. They were very active in the unions. The first anarchists that I believe were uh, leaders of the uh, of the leaders. As a matter of fact, we had uh, even one that was the president, who was uh, of the. Um, ILGWU, who was an anarchist. And therefore, we were able to exist because we were interested in the labor unions, we were interested in cooperatives, and we were very active there. And we, expressing ourselves in the Freie Arbeitsstimme, was our paper that we could propagate with it. That's what the, the important thing is, why. And naturally, if I could sell the paper, it was propaganda. My early youth, I hung on the fringe of the communists, and when I saw a few of their deals personally, I, I said, not for me. And then through another friend, I came to these people, and I was with them all the time, ever since, and that was in my 20s. I've been with them a good 50 years. Their philosophy, their thinking, their dealing, one with the other, their concern for each other. There's at least a little thread of humanity not for the purpose of what's dictated from above. Anarchism is a philosophy which rejects all forms of government. It's the only radical movement, communism, socialism, although the communists and socialists ultimately also reject government, but it's the only radical movement which wants to get rid of the government right now. Freedom now is an anarchistic slogan, to abolish the state. The anarchists see the state and the church as the twin evils of oppression in modern society. In addition to opposing the state and wanting to abolish or do away with the state, all anarchists believe in a decentralized form of society. They saw the great trends of the 1920th century seem to be, at least superficially, towards more and more centralization, great hierarchies where the individual was losing his, his sense of individuality and his power to the state, both economic and political. Well, the anarchists were individualists, they were federalists in advocating a loose-knit, decentralized society. They were anti-statists, they were anti-militarists, passionately against warfare, preaching love and brotherhood rather than hatred and war. Well, most of the people who founded the Freie Arbeitsstimme were active in the Freie Arbeitsstimme and supported it continuously until the very end, were people of the needle trades. The same people who were also active in organizing the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers' Union, the Millinery Workers, the Pocket work Workers, the uh, uh, Fourier Workers, they were all people that worked with the needle. Ich bin nicht bei mir. Nicht bei uns, wie Moses. Bei mir arbeiten nicht die Junioren, bei mir arbeiten Landleute. 
Und die alle muss auch mit den Nudeln nicht genau, aber du musst eine Mischbuche. Ah, ja, Mischbuche. Wer hat der Wasser in Amerika wäre? Am Kanal! The general struggle was to make a union shop and to make union hours. Now we worked, when I came up to the shop, we worked Saturdays and we worked uh, uh, the nine hours a day. We, uh, worked very hard, you know, it wasn't as freedom as uh, it is later on. But the anarchists didn't like their behavior, their action in the Union. They wanted more freedom in the Union. They wanted that uh, should elect people from the shops. And uh, naturally it was as usual, I don't know whether you're acquainted with unions, but there's a machine and they elect whomever is, uh, that they feel like. We happened to get in because we were very active and the workers voted for us. I think they made a constructive contribution to the, to the union, especially in the beginning, where it was a, a question of a good deal of uh, self-sacrifice. I think they, uh, many of the, uh, the radicals you know, were in those days were ready to sacrifice their time, their energy, their health for the activists in the Union. To go out and pick it at any time during the day or night was a, was a duty and a responsibility that was readily accepted and carried out. There was no problem of getting people when it came especially to the anarchists, the socialists, and the radicals, you know, to, to go. They showed an example to all the others. They were the first ones on the line. doing? What were some of your activities in the, within the movement? Well, what shall I say? I started off as a kid, young fellow, got into Syracuse, New York, and a strike broke out. Spontaneously, Little Falls, New York. And the Italian comrades there asked me to go down there and lead the strike. I led the strike down there for several weeks. Surrounded many times by gunmen at night in the halls. That time pickets didn't have liberties like they had today. And I conducted that strike until Bill Haywood came down from Paris and took over. There I left Chicago. Just prior to that, I'd been involved in a strike of Rochester, New York, the clothing cutters. I lost my job. That's why I had to go to Utica. And Utica involved in the Little Falls strike, so I had to leave there. So I came to Chicago. And I tried to get a job in Chicago and couldn't get a job because the association had to be blacklisted. So I went down to St. Louis and tried to get a job, couldn't get that job. Well, then I got back to Chicago. I got active then in, in the Amalgamated Union and worked as a clothing cutter. 
But then during the 1915 strike, I was arrested 39 times. Because, you know, the policeman watches you, and if you hit him with your hands, then he arrests you. So he shouldn't be arrested, so I used to, with my knee. <laughs> the, the policeman said once to the judge, you know, I was arrested when it came to the trial. So the uh, judge asked him, what did you do? He says, Your Honor, she hit me. So he gives a look, and I was standing in the pit. So he says, she hates you. She's so small. He says, Your Honor, she jumped up. <laughs> <laughs> it was true, I slept. <laughs> so naturally, you know, those things happen very often. Because when you go and take down a shop, you get in a fight. But you don't want the policeman to see you because he's arresting you. So you try to do it your way, the way you can. How many times are you arrested? Oh, plenty. But I used to go out from the, you know, the lawyer would bill, bill me out, and I would go back to the picket line. I never seen uh, I always would go back because I did things there that arrest you because you start a fight with them. But the way I fought them, they couldn't see it. So they arrest me because I was in the crowd to fight. Well, uh, but they didn't see me actually doing it. So you were an agitator. <laughs> well, we all try to do our best. was teeming, teeming at that side at that time there were all kinds of uh, activities there were there were the literary cafes where writers Jewish writers used to get together there was the theatrical cafe that was the cafe royale on 12th street and second avenue 
you know, where the theatrical people used to get together. Then there was the cafe where rank and file used to go to, like uh, the cafe on, on 2nd Avenue and uh, St. Mark's Place. There was a waiter by the name of Charlie. He was the, the nerve center for all the, the uh, communications, communication nerve center for all the, the messages and uh, whatever we needed, see. We leave word with Charlie. And uh, spend hours, have a cup of coffee there and spend hours, you know, kibitzing and uh, discussing and trying to solve the problems of the world, see. If we take the trouble to look at what we call the lexicon of Yiddish literature, which is a, an eight or nine volume work, we'll notice that most, the most famous Yiddish writers will have a notation that they started their debuts were in, on the pages of the Freie Arbeiterstern. And this was not just a, a coincidence, it was a pattern. It happened. Every budding writer, poet, dramatist, short storyteller knew that if he has any, if he shows any signs of talent, it will be recognized by the then editor Saul Janowski, who had an uncanny feeling to recognize who has in him something and who is just a, uh, a, a dilettante. And he would have, in each issue of the Freie Arbeiterstimme, a special column where he would answer. And he would tell the guys, you better go back to shoemaking, or you, better, you, you become a street, you, your talent shows that you're going to be a good street cleaner, something like this. But on the other hand, if he discovers something, he printed it, and he encouraged the fellow. Geiser, geiser, stiller Drimmel. Bist kein Heilung für mein Schmerz, bist kein End für euch das Rufen, euch das Suchen von mein Herz. In der Schönheit suche ich Sturm, in dem Sturm suche ich Ruhe, auf dem Busen von dem Sturm mache ich meine Augen zu. Giving out leaflets, that's all we knew. There was a man by the name Marcus. I don't know if you heard of him. He was the craziest vegetarian. He only lived on nuts and raisins. That's it. And he was wearing rubber shoes. And he was the craziest anarchist we ever had. He was the one that used to write. But the whole work was, for us, was given that literature. We were going to lectures. There was an awful lot of doings at that time. Labor Temple, 40th Street, was a very busy place. And my Goldman used to lecture there, Boitman used to be there, Where, whoever was in, uh, Durant, uh, Will, William Durant he used to lecture there, everybody used to lecture there. There was a, a beautiful place, we used Friday night, how did we go to, to the lecture? It was never, never a Friday night that we didn't go to hear a lecture. Saturday night we had a dance, but that was when we were in your age. At this point, we don't need a dance. <laughs> I mean, life wasn't all dull for these anarchists. It wasn't all the sweatshop, although many hours of their, their day were spent working. They had their evenings. The amazing thing is they had enough energy in the evening to attend lectures. And for the one day that they were free from their, their jobs, they would go on an anarchist picnic, or they would go to an anarchist dance. The sorts of dance they had were the, the Beurenbau, Borenbell means the peasant dance, where they would all dress up as peasants and apples would hang from the ceiling and they'd try to bite into them and they would hold raffles to raise money for the cause. The Arrestantenbeller, the Borenbeller, these are the arrested balls, the peasant balls, which were held to raise funds for the prisoners under the Tsar. And they sent large sums of money. These working people who would have to save pennies to contribute to the movement and to subscribe to their newspapers would send substantial sums of money to Tsarist Russia uh, through the Anarchist Red Cross. They founded an Anarchist Red Cross in the years before the First World War. So I say it was a whole world. In the 1960s and 1970s, we heard a great deal about the libertarian counterculture, which was counterposed to the American culture of statism, of militarism. 
Well, this had already evolved in the 1880s, 90s, and in the decades before the First World War. I'd like to welcome all of you to the seventh annual reunion of the Friends of the Ferrer Modern School. We've got a pretty good program set up for this afternoon. This is a reunion of the Ferrer School. It's our seventh one, and about 100 to 200 of us come together every year, and there are very warm refreshments of our memories and of our friendships as we, as we gather this way. No one has lost any interest in, in coming each year. What, what was the Ferrer School? Was it an anarchist experiment or an educational experience? Or? The Ferrer School was an anarchist experimental school inspired by the work that Francisco Ferrer had been doing in Spain until he was martyred. And uh, anarchists in America and in many countries organized such free schools where the children went to school and did not have to do anything that was set out by a teacher, but did the things they wanted to do. The school as it was run, and it was run differently often at different times throughout the years that it was in existence, but the period that I remember, there was a great attempt to keep apart politics and religion and everything else from the school. The school was run by the kids, more or less, with the adults. It was a common, they had a common meeting and, and we ran the school. You didn't have the kind of generation gap which we've seen in, in recent years because there was nobody you were fighting against, in effect. The, the teachers were there, and they usually were called by their first name, and um, they were one of us all. You weren't forced to go to classes. You weren't forced to um, uh, have marks or anything else. You could decide what you wanted to do. So that there was no, there was no, the authority came from not only yourself, but the whole student and school community. The idea was that if children were removed from a regimented and demanding society which deformed them and put into a free uh, ambiance, they would develop naturally and they would naturally learn as long as there was any opportunity to learn. Of course, living was learning and learning was something that children naturally did. Most people who have heard of the term anarchism, it's almost a synonym for terrorist. The anarchist is a wild-eyed, wild-haired person with a black cape, with a dagger in one hand, a bomb sputtering already in the other. Well, it is true that there was a terrorist element in the anarchist movement. A small minority, the vast majority of anarchists were very gentle and very idealistic people. And in fact, frowned upon uh, unmotivated terrorism and violence. The socialists would have nothing to do with this sort of thing, and they rejected terrorism altogether, whereas the anarchists tend, uh, tended at least to defend the terrorists, even when they didn't agree with them. Incidentally, I don't want to go to the other extreme to deny that there were any terrorists among the anarchists. What I'm emphasizing is it was a small minority, that is, there were a handful of individuals who carried out terrorist acts, a small segment of the movement who supported them. A fairly large segment sympathized with these terrorists, whom they saw as... Uh, avengers and deliverers, you see. People who were uh, doing propaganda not by the word as in the Friar of the Shtima, but by the deed to inspire people to act and to make a revolution. In all the Kassen, Blumen geht, Herdmann, Sabas, Dovkes, Jinglach, Meidach, Kind und Keitsch, wo sind Pumpe, Bovkes? Jinglach, Meidach, Kind und Keitsch, wo sind Pumpe, Bovkes? Genug schon wieder hore wenn genug schon morgen leien. Mach das aber Stoffke, lo mir Brieder sich befreien. Mach das aber Stoffke, lo mir Brieder sich befreien. Brieder und Schwester, lo mir den Körn die Hände. Lo mir Nikolai, kann ich zerbrechen die Hände. Der 
Schwester, lo mir gehen zusammen. Lo mir Nikolai kennen, da grob mit der Mann. Hey, hey, da neu Polizei, da neu Samen der Schaf jetzt. Brass, hey. Nacht in Hotel geführt, hat der Gelle mich. Ein zu sehr geborener Kapitalist. Hey, hey, da neu Polizei. In 1919, when the Communist Party started in the United States, it was a terrible blow to the Yiddish anarchists and to the readers of the Freie Arbeiterstimme. What happened is this. Just as in Soviet Russia, the Communists used anarchist slogans. When, for instance, Lenin promulgated the slogan of the factory to the workers, the land to the peasants, all power to the Soviets. This is pure and simple anarchy. Remember, he never mentioned in all these three slogans, not the state, not the, 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 the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, when, uh, when the anarchists listened to these slogans, they were attracted to them. So here in the United States, just as way there, uh, as in Russia, Anarchists worked with the Bolsheviks at the very beginning. But here, an interesting thing happened. Yanovsky, that clear-headed guy, said the Bolsheviks will never introduce these slogans, into, will never practice what they preach. This is just a lie. It's not true. They're not going to give all the power to the... They're not going to give all the power to the Soviets. They're not going to give the factories to the workers. They're not going to give the land to the peasants. Everything will belong to the state. And he was against joining the Bolsheviks, against joining the communists here. And many of the young anarchists, most of the young anarchists, the most active, broke away, broke away from the Yiddish anarchists, broke away from the Freiheit of the and weakened it. And they formed the backbone of the Communist Party in the United States. Ich bring euch a Gris in the trenches. Ich bring euch a Gris in the boys. We kämpfen mit Mut, mit Courage and mit Blut. In fin die Deutschen lachen sie sich euch. Ich bring euch a Gris in the Sammies. Du siehst der Gris, du suchen sie. With the uh, war, a tremendous hysteria seized the country. The atmosphere was terrible. They hated the Germans, so in the city here, you couldn't say, I want a pound of uh, a can of sauerkraut. You didn't buy sauerkraut. You bought liberty cabbage. Uh, the mayor, the mayor, a bastard if ever there was one, he said, all red, all signs must not use red red paint because we don't want them reds around. You wouldn't even have the color. No red was to be in any of the colors or flags or anything in a school or anything else. Mobs, mobs and mobs of people chased the anarchists. The, the, the attorney general was a man named Palmer. And uh, the raids were made against all radical halls and homes of individuals. And uh, they'd get into a place and they'd uh, wreck the office, they'd uh, break the machines. They would arrest uh, people on no charges at all, uh, let them out, then uh, arrest them again. 
Actually, the, the Palmer raids were the tail end of this. It all begins during the war itself, where the anarchists were, for the most part, what they called internationalists. They refused to take sides in the war. They were against war. They considered it to be a capitalist struggle where the working man was used as cannon fodder for the purposes of imperialism and the spread of their own local interests, business interests. And the anarchists, of course, refused to fight. Many of them were pacifists by conviction. Others would not take up arms for any government. Not only did they refuse to fight, they agitated against conscription. When conscription was introduced in this country, America entered the war in April of 1917. Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman and many of the people associated with the Fayab Dishtema conducted rallies and made speeches trying to discourage people from registering for the draft. And eventually they were prosecuted. Uh, there were several laws that passed during the First World War. Espionage Act was one of them, for example, under which many anarchists and wobblies and militant socialists were tried and eventually convicted, sent to prison, and then ultimately deported. Uh, in one boatload alone on the Buford in December of 1919, um, the cargo contained 250 anarchists who were being shipped back to Russia, including Emma Goldman and Alexander Burton. Well, uh, let's be honest about it. Most of our friends got underground. In other words, the thing became so that everybody was being arrested, and people, if they could possibly get laid low, they laid low. No question about it. They laid low. Everybody, was, in fact, I was arrested during the war at the picnic of the Workers' Institute. That time I made an anti-war speech. I was arrested and thrown into jail. I was in jail from Sunday until Thursday. I was taken for the commissioner Thursday, and the commissioner happened to be a man named Schlottfield, a German, who I think his sympathies may have been a little bit the other way. I was taken to the commissioner. He said to me, that was at a picnic? You were drinking? You had a lot of liquor in you? So I said, I was drunk. He said, you wouldn't say it if you're sober, would you? Discharged. Otherwise, I'd been in jail for years. When the raids were over, they began to look for individuals. And apparently, they had my name on the list. But I understood that they were coming to look for people there. That they're not just going to let me go for nothing. So I didn't go home. But they went to my house. And they came into the room. I had a room with people there. And they came in, the people had them in, so they looked over the literature and they saw my books were all on anarchism. And they were looking for something to get to recognize me. But after they, they didn't find anything there, they looked at the wall, they saw a painting hanging. So they asked the people whose painting it is, so they said, that's mine. And they took all that painting and they hung it up in the police station. And 20 years later, I came in with Nelson, we were arrested and brought into that precinct. And Nelson says to me, give a kick. And I looked up and there was my painting. <laughs> 20 years after that. You know, there was a guy named Moses. Oh. Well, he had a brother. And that brother's name was the name of the Shelly. Yes, yeah, right. Right. Yeah, I heard it in Yiddish, you see. No. That's the way it's spelled in Hebrew. Selma and I did not marry until a few years ago. Why didn't you we, marry? I guess because we were our anarchists and we didn't uh, regard a marriage by either a clerical, either by a clerical group or by the state as necessary for our marriage, for our living together. However, as we reached the age of uh, retirement and social security, I had heard the stories of other anarchists, uh, of the great, difficult, great difficulties they had to establish their right to social security uh, when they were not uh, married. And I thought it would be better to avoid this difficulty and get legally married. I went there with my daughter and her children, and my grandchildren were the witnesses to the marriage that we had. Lynn and Gerald were about three or four years younger, or five years younger, and they were our witnesses. Do you remember the marriage we had? Yeah. One of the most important reasons for the decline of the Jewish anarchist movement, and of the, the whole old immigrant movement, uh, which saw its height from 1880 to 1920, was that they were dying out. 
and uh, the number of Yiddish readers was dying out in general. As I say, anarchism for them was part of their immigrant experience, that their revulsion against America in which they couldn't find a place, a comfortable place. They couldn't speak the language. They were being forced to work for small wages in sweatshops, long hours, and so on, so that they rebelled and reacted against this and became radicals and joined the anarchist movement. But times had changed even there. They were collecting social security checks. They were receiving higher wages. They had bought themselves homes and automobiles. And they were living a pretty much, in many cases, a middle-class existence. And their children were not carrying the torch of anarchism. The children were American-born. They faced none of the problems that the immigrants faced in terms of culture, alienation, language, exploitation, oppression. They lived rather comfortably. They spoke English. They were native-born. They went to school here. In many cases, they became professionals. They went to law school and medical school. They were assimilated very rapidly. Uh, it was very difficult for the old generation to be assimilated. So now, you, you have been an anarchist all these years. And what about your, your children or your grandchildren? Are any of them anarchists? No, they, you see, they don't now. For instance, my son, he believes in every tier of the anarchists. But, he says, he wouldn't belong to any uh, group or any bears. There is none where he leaves. And so they uh, passed the life away without uh, being active. He would come, he used to come to the fire. After him, if he do something, he would help out, but he, uh, none of them. Do you feel that they're really missing something important? Personally, yes, I would like them to. But you see, anarchist movement is not the movement that you have a say, or uh, like the communists, you impose things of uh, your ideas. We don't. We can talk to them, uh, agitate it, but we don't impose. So you do as you please. And the same thing was with the kids. They know that I'm an anarchist and they uh, really respect me and everything. And they'll go with me when I'll ask them, or uh, they'll give me money when I need for the movement. But they themselves, uh, he says, I don't want to call myself an anarchist because I'm not doing anything. Well, my grandfather was Joseph Cohen. He was uh, an anarchist leader, and as much as an anarchist can have a leader, and he was, about 50 years ago, he was the editor of the Fry Arbiter Stima for several years. And uh, I guess he's the person in our family, in my family's history, that I know the most about. Uh, everyone in the family has always been very proud of him and what he did. And so my father's always been uh, taking great pains to explain to me what an anarchist was from the time when I was a very little boy. Your grandfather was an anarchist. He was a philosophical anarchist. He believed uh, that people should live together in peace and he didn't throw bombs. And that's always irritated my father tremendously, that people thought that all anarchists were bomb throwers and never bothered to learn what the ideas of Kropotkin or uh, any of the other anarchists were. A world wo keiner wird nit regieren über dem anderen's Arbeit und mi. Frei wird sein jedes Herz und Gehirn. Das ist Anarchie. A world wo Freiheit wird jeden beglicken, dem Schwachen und Starken, dem Er und Sie. Wo deins und meins wird keinem nit dritten. Das ist Anarchie. Look at me. Look at me. Do you recognize? Oh, yes. Wasn't well, she good looking in those years? This is Molly Steimer, right? Yeah. 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 Molly and Fanny Ressler. Pass them, pass them. It's the only picture yes. so, uh, Molly has of me. That's yeah. I think, uh... How does your anarchism apply to your life today? Well, today, very, very little. But it is this small group, and I'm sure, in case of need, one for the other. We wouldn't hesitate or stop at, at any time. That's within what Kropotkin our, called mutual aid. And within our means of physically and financially. And we've been doing it. So anarchism is, is not just a theory. It's something that you have to, be, you right. have to apply it as an right. ethic. It's an I, ethic know, that you, I know personally, yeah. I can say, and I really live the anarchism. And I feel that anarchism, you have to live, not only preach it and talk about it, you have to give an example of yourself. 
You know, when two Jews get together, there's always a third question, three questions. And the same with the anarchists. Uh, law and order among ourselves could be better, better organized. Uh, but uh, the, the worth sentiments of each other, you don't get. At least I didn't get it in all my years anywhere else. Henry Gibson, 1870, writing a letter to Gorg Brandes said, tie yourself to a star and sail with it. Every person must have a star, an ideal, to which he clings. The ideal may not be realized today or tomorrow, but you must have an ideal which will carry you forward in life, will inspire you to do deeds and acts. We are living in a society May pro we have made economic progress, we may have made here some slight progress, but ultimately we are living a society with our slaves, poverty, misunderstanding, social injustice, all the wrongs of society. And there are people like, foolish like myself and many others, call ourselves anarchists, who feel that this injustice can be done away with, that people can be educated. We must in our soul believe that justice must prevail. We must have that concept that we are going to carry on, little by little. If the, you see, the trouble is, when you get people into a movement, and they see the revolution in, in over tomorrow, and it doesn't come tomorrow, they become dissolution. They were never revolutionaries. They never had a concept, a true understanding. If the understanding, no matter what happens, you will carry on that ideal. You feel that justice must prevail. The concept of justice, moral certainty, that right is right, it is the doctrine that no matter what you call it, anarchist syndicalist, anarchist individualist, anarchist communist, whatever label you put to it, what is the ultimate goal of all these scattered ideas? Whether it's the idea of Proudhon, whether it's Kropotkin, whether it's, it's Malatesta or anyone else, each one had little variations. But the ultimate ideal, the ultimate concept, of all of these people was ultimate human justice for everybody. And that is the ideal that anarchism stands for. Wer schreckt sich unhoch Meure, will mit uns in Kampf nicht gehen. Jener is a schlafke boy, jener is a schlafke boy, und soll bleiben in der Heim. Jener is a schlafke boy, jener is a schlafke boy, und soll bleiben in der Heim. Vor Betriebe in die Rehen, die Plakaten trocht vor Reus, mach mit Scale. Gang zu 